This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Take Control Books, the answers you need now from leading experts. Learn more and download yours at TakeControlBooks.com. Welcome back to Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. For the first time in entirely too long a time, I have the pleasure of saying Mr. Ted Landau. Ted, it's great to have you back. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming back. Mr. Chuck Joyner, thanks for having me back. Yeah, well, it hasn't been as long as I've, I, it feels like because you did participate in uh, one of the Mac jury discussions mm -hmm. on Apple's special uh, events, announcements and all that. But it's been a while since you and I have had a chance to just sit down and analyze everything that's going on. And just uh, a few things have happened that make it seem like it's been a long time, too. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Been a busy month. <laughs> a very busy month. So let's just get it out of the way first. Which iPhone 6 did you get? <laughs> I got the iPhone 6 4.7 inch screen, the basic one. Okay. And are you happy with it? Yes. Um, I'm very happy with it. I, I, actually, I, excuse me, I, I'm much happier with it than, than the iPhone 5 in terms of the size of the screen. Uh, there are things I liked about the iPhone 5 design that, that sort of, I like them both. That sort of industrial aluminum emphasized along the sides design um, I actually like very much but I've also been I'm very attracted to the new one too I like the the edge to edge curved glass um, screen on the front and it's of course thinner in appearance than the the older iPhone which I think looks nice and in fact it looks so nice to me that I, I decided not to go with a case this time because it just seemed to me that any case I got was going to make the iPhone look worse than it already did uh, uh, and so uh, I'm going without a case but but uh, in terms of the actual size, you know, in terms of there's some people, you know, there are there's you know there's various camps on the size. There are some people who say that the 4.7 inch iPhone 6 is already too big for them, and they wish that they that there was a a four inch iPhone 6 that they could get instead. That's not me. Uh, I, I the, the 4.7 inch is noticeably bigger, but um, in a good way for me. Uh, I appreciate the extra screen real estate. It makes everything I'm doing easier, and does and the phone itself doesn't seem that much larger. That that I find it a negative, as opposed to the six plus, which I there's a part of me that wants a six plus. You know, there's a part of me that you know that always wants the biggest and the best. And there are a couple of features of the six plus, as, as you know, like the optical image stabilization that isn't in the six, uh, and everything that I like about the six in some sense you could say is even better in the six plus you know you could say well if you think you think if you think you like the bigger screen in the six wait till you try the six plus because it's even bigger uh and that's true but at some point the scales tip and the downside of of having the, all those advantages is offset by having this super large iphone that i don't want uh and uh, a friend of mine got one of the uh, Samsung 5.5 or whatever, approximately 5.5 inch phones, like a year ago, and the first time I saw it, I just was aghast. I mean, I just, oh my god, you know, you you, you want to carry that around all the time, and and you know, all the jokes that people make, it looks like you're putting a shoe to your ear when you want to make a phone call. I mean, that's the way it struck me, and I said, wow, I'm never going to get a phone that big. Uh, and here I am thinking about it. <laughs> you know, so, so times do change, but but even so, um, I decided that the that the six plus was just too big for me now. Maybe next year, after I'm used to the six, and the, and the step up isn't so great, I'll I'll rethink it. But for now, I'm happy with the six. What about you? I well, as folks who watch the show regularly know, I got the the plus. Mm -hmm. um, I really like it. Uh, I'm I'm in that strange period um, where. I'm not completely comfortable holding this yet, but if I take if I pull out my iPhone 5s, it feels a little small. Just yesterday, I had an occasion to uh, somebody handed me their their four, and mm. uh, you know to take a call, and it's like it's looks, yeah, this so thing feels like a matchbook. You know, yeah, you feel like doesn't it come with a magnifying glass yeah. or something? <laughs> <laughs> Which just it felt surpri so surprisingly small in my hand. So mm -hmm. I'm right now. I'm in a in a state where nothing feels completely like it really should. It's just mm -hmm. they're they're all just different, and I'm working on this. Um, and I've also said this before. I love I love everything about this phone. I'm, I'm working on the size, but the only thing the only mistake I made was getting the the silver with the white face. I it's just me. I want a black face. Yeah. Good. 
Yeah. yeah, it looks especially looks nice when it's off because you can't even see the the border between the screen and 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 the uh, case itself. It looks like it's all black. It's kind of nice. Yeah, like the Model S from two thousand one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think this may be going back in favor of that when when I have the chance. Um, well, you know, like I said in the article that I wrote on the six versus the six plus, there isn't a correct answer. I, I don't think there's one that's the best one. It, it depends on how you use it. Like like for instance. Uh, one of the reviews I read of from someone who favored the 6 Plus, and, and I read, by the way, there seems to be no consensus. I think I've read just as many reviews that say the 6 is the one to get versus the 6 Plus is the one to get, which is exactly what you'd expect when it's so much on the fence. But one of the things I read on, uh, from someone who said he was definitely committed to the 6 Plus, that this was perfect, he said, you know, something like, and, I, and for the first time, I can edit and write blog entries to the website, whatever website he was writing for. Um, you know, right from my iPhone. Could never do that before. And I'm thinking to myself as I read that, that's nothing I want to do on the iPhone. <laughs> there's, there's no way, you know, even even if I had the 6 Plus, I wouldn't be writing blog entries on my iPhone. It's just, I don't, it's not, <coughs> excuse me, it's not part of my work style. Uh, I work on blog entries when I'm home. And when I'm home, I have a Mac Pro, a MacBook Pro, a 12, uh, a 10 inch uh, iPad. Uh, you know, I have all sorts of devices that are easier for working on my blog than my iPhone. Uh, and, and so the idea that I might be able to better edit on, on a 6 Plus than a 6 isn't a consideration for me when, when I'm making the choice. And so that's one of the reasons that, you know, that that person le- leans towards the 6 Plus and I lean towards the 6. Yeah. It, it's been interesting to just hear people make well, try to be authoritative about it, and I'm with you. I don't think there's a right answer. I think Apple was smart in putting just this much differentiation between the two so that you had a decision to make because otherwise I think a lot of people, unless you were absolutely sold on a larger phone, mm-hmm. the default would have been the 6. But with that, with those couple little features, it, it made you have to decide, and I think a lot of people at least decided to experiment with the 6 Plus and are liking it. Yeah. And some are returning too, from what I've been reading. Is that really a surprise, Ted? I mean, no. this is a big jump. Yeah, I think especially people who pre-ordered it before they could hold one in their hands, maybe uh, are being a little surprised at how big it actually is, and that may be leading to some returns. But uh, I think if you get one, you know, I I I, I, I tweeted about this. I said, you know, I'm going to get the six, and if I don't like it, I'll upgrade to the six plus. And some people say, "Well, I'm going to get the six plus, and if I don't like it, I'm going to downgrade to the six. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and uh, which, in some sense, probably is a better way to go because the six plus is in shorter supply, so you'll be able to return it and downgrade to a six easier than the other way around. But but supply issues aside, you know, which which was the better direction to go? Um, I think if I'd gotten the six plus first, I'd be more inclined to keep it. Uh, which is one of the reasons I didn't want to do it that way. I just, you know, once you get it, and, uh, I'm just going to keep it, uh, unless it really affected me negatively. And and I and I felt like, well, I probably wind up keeping it and maybe regretting it down the road. I don't know. So I, I decided to pick with go with the one that I thought I was most likely going to want and then let inertia take its course. So <laughs> just do nothing and I stay with it, which is what I'm doing. So Yeah. And that's, I've, I've probably got the inertia going the other direction where I'll probably stay with this, except yeah. for the color. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been everything that I had kind of hoped it is. is it, it feels faster on this one. The battery life is definitely longer. The camera is, makes a huge difference. Um, so they're, they're just every, everything they advertised is pretty much there. iOS eight is definitely there. I, there are a lot of things I like about it. Of course, there was a little hiccup with the, uh, with the 8.0.1 update. As I recall, um, as I recall, a few hours ago, (laughs) yeah, it uh, it got pulled, and uh, but not before a lot of people made the mistake of just not being able to. They just couldn't wait to do the update, and of course, in some cases, they break their phone. Yeah, I mean, to be, I don't know, fair isn't the right word, but it's a serious problem for anyone that's happened to, and it's certainly an embarrassment for Apple because it made national news. I mean. How many times does a update to eight point zero point anything by any product make the make the national news? Not too often. It's just an evidence of what a big deal Apple is for anything that they do. Uh, but uh, so yeah, there's no getting around it. It's embarrassing. But 
keeping it in context, number one, it only affected people who had a six and a six plus, so anybody else is unaffected. And it only affected a relatively probably small number of people who got it and updated to it within the first hour that it was out because it only took a little over an hour before Apple pulled it from, from the way I understood things. Uh, so, I mean, probably it'd probably be safe to say that over 90% of iPhone and iPad users were unaffected by this. Uh, and so in that sense, it's not that huge deal. Uh, and, and then, of course, Apple promises in two or three days that they're going to come out with 8.0.2, which will address the problem. They gave a workaround, uh, posted to their website, even if it was a little hard to find, uh, about how to fi fix it in the meantime. And so really, uh, in, in the end, you know, a couple of weeks from now, assuming that, that 8.0.2 you know, ends the story, this is just going to be forgotten. You know, or, or just casually mentioned, but of no big consequence. Ted, I, I want to make sure that we touch on this. Um, the pre-orders were four million, as I recall, mm -hmm. um, for the for the that that first weekend, mm -hmm. and then well, excuse me, the pre-orders, and then they sold out, um, and then the the first uh, weekend they sold ten million iPhone sixes. I think that's including the four million. So it's yeah, like 10 oh, million. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what a shame. Um, and that was without China, so mm -hmm. I, I, I was, and I was surprised at the lines. I mean, we had lines again, big lines, major lines, mm -hmm. at at the Apple stores. I went to a Verizon. Uh, excuse me, sorry. I went to an AT and C store. There was a line. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, Verizon. There was no line at their kiosk <laughs> where I was, but uh, it. I didn't. I don't know that I've. I realized there was this kind of pent up demand for this iPhone, uh, and I don't think it was just people up. Upgrading their old iPhones. I think it was people making a switch over. Yeah, I guess I wasn't as surprised. First, you remind me. I tweeted the other day when the 10 million figure came out. I said, "So feeling lucky that you managed to snag an iPhone over the weekend?" Yes, and I said, "Yeah, sure you are." As are 10 million other people. <laughs> so, <laughs> feeling special. I didn't say not feeling lucky. Feeling special. Yeah, feeling as, special. As, as, as are 10 million other people. Yes, we're all special. And then someone tweeted back to me. He says, "Yes, we're all special snowflakes." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> but yes, to, to, uh, getting back to the lines, you know, I, I had a feeling when when I saw them at the event that this was going to be a line generator, so to speak. Uh, the the fact this was the first time that Apple was making a phone in the four point seven and five point five inch sizes uh, that had become very popular uh, on the Android side over the past year or two, and so I, I, a lot of people who were were hanging back waiting for a larger phone got their prayers answered so to speak with, with, with this one and i think that's uh, that's plus you know the it has some significant new features the, the camera makes a difference i think to some people the the promise of apple pay makes a difference uh and and so uh, i think um you know I, as soon as i saw you know that they were going for these really large sizes i said yeah this is this is going to get people's attention and it did yeah, it definitely did. It definitely did. So th the other big thing that's going on right now, the other controversy about the iPhone is uh, that it can be bent or allegedly can be bent. Or only yours, apparently. The, the iPhone 6 Plus is, yes. seems to be the locus of the bending attention. Yeah. I, first of all, I mean, I'm sorry, but, you know, it's not lead pipe. So if you put enough pressure on it, I think it's going to bend. It's not built to be impervious to anything. Anybody that puts, anybody that just spent the money on this and puts it in their hip pocket and sits down deserves to get a bent phone. Um, but it, it also now that the information as of right now as we're taping this um, is that Apple's really only had nine reports of bent phones. Yeah, I think it's a tempest in a teapot, as they used to say. Uh, I mean, a number of things. First, I think. As, as several websites have reported, this is not the first phone to report being bent. It's, uh, it's not like Apple is the originator of this problem. Uh, Samsung uh, and other Android phones have had this problem as well. And it's a problem with any thin device that gets this large. And as you say, you put it in your back pocket. I think, I think the issue, uh, probably the iPhone 6 Plus is more susceptible to the problem than the 6 because it's larger. You can just imagine something, you have something this large and, and you want to bend it, it it's going to be more bendable than something very small that you're trying to bend. So the larger it gets, the more susceptible it is. I think that's true. Uh, and, and then the fact that it's so large, I think some people probably were tempted to put it in their back pocket rather than their hip pocket because it fit more comfortably there. 
Uh, and, and so that uh, those two things together, I think, made it more likely that uh, the, those people, you know, that this problem was going to emerge in the people who tried that. And I, you know, I agree with you. I think no business sticking your iPhone in your back pocket and then sitting down on it. Uh, I, I accidentally broke a point and shoot camera that way over the summer where I stuck it in my back pocket uh, and then forgot while I was walking around taking pictures, you know, stick it in my pocket, take it out again. For some reason, I don't remember why. It was just more convenient to do it in my back pocket. Uh, and then I completely forgot that I'd left it there and then went to have lunch. And while I'm having lunch, I hear crack. <laughs> and, and I go, uh-oh. And I take out my phone and the way I was sitting, I managed to um, break the display. Um, and, and then it wouldn't take pictures anymore. And so that that was the end of that. So yeah, I mean, it happens with anything that you stick in your back pocket and put a lot of weight on it. I, I, to criticize Apple or, or the iPhone Six Plus as, as somehow special, I think is 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 where the error is. And what you were saying about the iOS eight issue, this issue, it it just seems like no matter when something comes out from Apple, as high profile as they've become. The least little thing, and it, it the, the 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 news media jumps on it, and it's not even just the tech media anymore. It's sort of the uh, the mainstream media also uh, brings it up and casts it in a negative light. Yeah, I was watching the CBS Evening News, um, which I think you have to be over fifty five to be allowed to watch, <laughs> um, <clears throat> based on the advertisements. Uh, but but fortunately, I was in that category. Uh, but I was watching, it and it was mentioned uh, midway through the evening news. You know, like this was a, a major news story. And uh, yeah, I, well, you know, it's the good and the bad. Apple has to take it either way. The the, the 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 upside is that the slightest good thing that Apple does is likely to make news too. So, um, and the slightest bad thing probably even more so because you know that's news. Yeah, yeah, the news in the twenty first century anyway. This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Take Control Books at TakeControlBooks.com. The answers you need now from leading experts. iOS 8 is out, and that means that the next iteration of Mac OS X, Yosemite, won't be far behind. Are you ready? Joe Kissel can get you there quick with his newest book, Take Control of Upgrading to Yosemite. Not only will Joe get you ready with his pre-release book, but you will also get a free upgrade once Yosemite is out to make sure you're taking full advantage of all the new features. And if you're concerned with the security of the data on your Mac, then you need FileVault, one of the best security features in Mac OS. In Take Control of FileVault, Joe Kissel explains how it works, why the latest version is light years better than the original, what features are available only from the command line, and much more. Finally, while you're on the site, check out the very first book from the new Crash Course series from Take Control Books, Read Me First, a Take Control Crash Course. Tanya Angst has written the book we all wish was available when we first started, and she's made it free so you can share it with friends and family who aren't as tech-savvy as you. Be sure to take advantage of the new social media sharing features and to appreciate the new layout of the Crash Course series. There will be many more. Go to Take Control Books right now and get these and many more great titles from authorities like Jeff Carlson, Michael E. Cohen, Glenn Fleischman, Kirk McElhern, and many more. Take Control Books, the answers you need now from leading experts. Thanks to Take Control Books for their ongoing support of Mac Voices. Well, something that I haven't talked about a lot on the show with anyone, and I th you're a good guy to talk about it with, is uh, the, the demise of the print version of Macworld Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, this this came as a bit of a surprise the day after the Apple special event. Uh, it, it affects a lot of our friends, uh, or it already has affected a lot of our friends. Mm -hmm. um, probably no surprise, at least in my mind, that the print version would go away. I was surprised at the, the bloodletting that occurred, uh, or, or layoffs, depending on how you want to characterize it. Uh, you, you may have some different perspective on it as a contributor or contributing editor. Um, so where do things stand? I mean, I know it's still going, the, the site is still going. Yeah. Um, no, I think what you said is pretty much the situation. Uh, the, I had heard, in terms of the print magazine itself, I think it was a little bit wishy-washy. On the one hand, my, my personal opinion was the print magazine was doomed. 
uh, PC World, which is IDG's sister publication for the PC side of things, had given up as print a year before. Uh, virtually all other computer magazines, with the exception of the Mac Life, I don't know where they're getting their infusion of money from, but somehow they seem to, to soldier on. But with the exception of that, virtually all tech magazines and certainly all other Apple centric magazines had long ago um, uh, uh, long ago gone. And so I thought it was just a matter of time before Macworld was gone as well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some of the people that Macworld I've spoken to had said, no, you know, we're encouraged that the print magazine can continue. They said it would continue as long as it continued making money. And as of six months ago, it was still making money. It was still profitable. Uh, so they were um, encouraged that the print magazine would continue for at least some indefinite period. No one, nobody that I knew, and, and I, I'm, my guess is that Jason probably knew, but wasn't telling me. Uh, but none of the people that I'm, you know, in more day-to-day -day contact with, um, seemed to have an inkling that this was coming. Uh, uh, but, but even so, like you said, I, 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 I wasn't shocked. I said, okay, so I wasn't, I wasn't expected to come this year. Maybe it would come next year, but it was coming. There's just no, no way around that. What I had no idea was coming. In fact, the first I heard of it, I was very busy that morning. I think I was working on articles, so I wasn't following my Twitter feed, or I would have known more about what was going on. But the first I heard of it was I got an email from someone at Macworld saying, You've, you may have heard or you will be hearing that we've stopped doing the print magazine. Um, and we just wanted to give you a heads up and let you know that this is a time more than ever that we're going to have to depend on our freelance writers. Uh, and me being one of them, he was just giving me the heads up. And, and so I mentioned it to Naomi, and Naomi said, my, it's my wife. Uh, and Naomi said, uh, so what does that mean for the people who work there? I said, oh, probably not that much. You know, now they'll just work on the website without having a print magazine to deal with. That was my initial thought and reaction. And then then I go on Twitter when I had a chance and see, oh, my God, <laughs> everybody's been laid off. It turns out that every single person that I personally know at Macworld, except for Chris Breen, was gone. Um, not, not all of them were laid off. I think Serenity Caldwell actually um, resigned because uh, she had another job. And technically, I think Jason resigned and wasn't laid off. But they were gone nonetheless the same week. And everybody else, uh, Dan Frakes, Dan Miller, Dan Morn, uh, all the people that I knew were, were gone. And it's just I couldn't believe it. I, my first thought was, and, and they said they're going to continue the magazine as a website. And I'm going, with who? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is Chris running the magazine himself? Who's writing the articles? Who's going to be in charge of assigning the articles? Who do you make pitches to if you want to write an article? Uh, I mean, how is it going to function with just Chris? Uh, and... Um, and it turns out that they brought a couple of people over from TechHive, another IDG website, and, uh, and I think one other person from someplace else in IDG. And basically, there's a staff now of about four or five people, as I understand it, that's running the website. And it's very different. Um, it's not, uh, I, to me, it's noticeably different because I'm familiar with the people who work there. And it was a great bunch of people. I, I mean, I was not only shocked, but saddened. That this, because I, they had assembled a group of people that had been together for years and had done a great job uh, and and were well respected and well liked in the industry and uh, and you know they the IDG simply decimated it for unclear reasons I mean I'm sure in their view to save money somehow uh, but uh, and now they have this website being run by Chris who I respect and wish him well but I mean I'll be surprised I'll, I'll be shocked again if a year from now I, I expect a year from now the website may be gone altogether. That's a possibility. It could be just as surprising as getting rid of the print magazine. Who knows? One day they can just shut the whole thing down, or it will be continued in such a way that it will have a lot, lost a lot of the prestige that it, that it had presently, uh, uh, or be transformed in some way. I'll be surprised if a year from now the website is still in the same position on the hierarchy of things as it is now. But. Maybe, you know, I could be wrong, but that's my feeling. And so it's just a very sad time. Of course, it's just sad with all the people that I know being out of work at the same time, and now probably looking for work and competing with each other in some sense for the, for the same small number of jobs. Yeah, I, first of all, you know, I think if there's anybody that can, can keep it rolling, it's Chris. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, no question about that. And I've, I don't know, I know by, by name, not 
personally some of the people that are still there still writing I, whose bylines I see so I'm I'm hopeful that things will continue I I was a little surprised just from the standpoint that Macworld always was was one of the V authorities in yeah. this space and with Apple as popular as it is now that they couldn't make a go of it or decided not to make a go of it when they had like you said it just an all-star team I, I don't know if it, it speaks to the, the amount of competition or the kind of coverage that the the tech public is looking for now, because there are there is a huge amount of competition mm -hmm. on all sides. So it it just it was just a surprising decision. Well, I mean they, there's a sort of an assumption in what you're saying that may or may not be true, that it was the correct decision from a business point of view. That somehow um this had to be done because that's the way things were going. But it isn't clear to me that it was the correct decision. <laughs> I'm yeah. willing to give them the benefit of the doubt there. Uh, that it may have been the correct decision to end the print magazine, but I'm not convinced it was the correct decision to get rid of all that staff. And, and that in the end, they might live to regret it. And, and so we'll have to wait and see how it plays out. It is true. I mean, they, they did face a dilemma uh, in the fact that without the print magazine, the print magazine generates a lot of money. Uh, advertising to the print magazine generates more money, at least if they're getting the advertising. Of course, you're not getting any advertising. It's not going to generate money. But assuming you're getting a decent amount of advertising, the, the advertising for the print magazine generates more revenue uh, than online advertising. Uh, and, uh, and so um, now you have a bunch of people whose salaries are linked to the idea that there's a print magazine to pay their salaries, and now there is no more print magazine. So uh, maybe that's since they looked and said, you know, either we have to tell these people that their salaries are going to be cut or lay them off. Uh, and so maybe that was part of the thinking. But but uh, um, <clears throat> in the end, uh, I still think it may be a mistake. On the other hand, I mean, the other only other thing I'll say is that you're right. The competition online, you know, if you're going to be a website. There, it especially becomes apparent to me in a week like this where iOS 8 and the iPhone 6 comes out. And I'm interested in learning as much about these things as I can and hearing other people's opinions and so on. And so I've been collecting reviews of iOS 8 and reviews of the iPhone 6. And it, it, there's so much that just becomes redundant. I mean, it's really unnecessary. I, I'm, I must have like two dozen reviews of the iPhone 6, and by the time I get to the 20th one, if not the 12th one, they're all saying the same thing. We just don't need 24 reviews of the iPhone 6 uh, the, the, on the web. It's just, and then how, you know, which ones become become the ones that people most read, that become the ones uh, that, that, that become the default standards among those reviews? Uh, or is it equally split? Or are there two or three that everybody reads and the rest get pretty much ignored? I don't know, but it's it's tough, and I think Macworld had some advantage there, I think, because of the print publication and because of the familiarity that there were people who would go to Macworld to read the reviews that maybe never heard of Ars Technica as a site or didn't know that Engadget was reviewing it or whatever. Uh, and, and so, and I, and I think that they'll hold on to that for a while because they have the brand name recognition, but at, at some point, if their reputation suffers, people are going to drift away. I, first of all, I did not mean to imply it was the correct decision by by any means. I, you know, I have no knowledge of that, nor would I want to. The the print publication just it, it was funny because I mentioned this to uh, to someone at the office, and they said that they had just recently um, started getting. I, I'm sorry, folks, I'm going to get this wrong. I may reverse it, so forgive me. But they had just started getting. I think better homes and gardens when they didn't subscribe to it because Ladies Home Journal has stopped mm -hmm. publishing, and mm -hmm. so they're having to fulfill the script subscription with something else. So you're seeing a lot of of old, well established publications go by the wayside. I thought I thought MacWorld did a better job than just about anyone in trying to transition that and make the web their web edition more relevant. Than, than really the magazine was because they could they could adjust it faster, produce more content for it. On the other hand, we've had some of these discussions before. You know, the the amount of revenue that can be generated by online advertising is not nearly what you can get out of a print publication, even with a limited circulation. So, 
there you go. Well, I and mean, you make a good point that, that that the print publication has evolved over the years as the web has become more dominant for Macworld, um, deliberately so and wisely so, I think, under, under Jason. Uh, and the end result is that the print publication today, 90, 90, 90 to 95 probably percent of what appears in the print publication has already appeared on the web, often weeks, more than a month in some cases, uh, before the magazine itself comes out. And so the magazine uh, depends on a, on a different type of user. If, if you like reading things on the web and prefer that to print, then you have no reason, no need to get the print magazine because there's nothing in the print magazine of any value of interest that you didn't already see on the web. I like the print magazine, uh, maybe it's because I'm older, even though I read a lot of their stuff on the web because it was sort of like a useful, the best of the month. You know, here's everything. We've looked at everything that Macworld has published in the last month and we've curated what we think is the best and most interesting thing and put it in a format that you can, you know, peruse without having to be online and deal with an electronic device. And I thought it was kind of nice once a month to get that viewpoint. But of course, I wasn't paying for a subscription, so <laughs> it was free for me anyway. So um, uh, it was very easy for me to say that. But uh, I sort of liked it. But again, I, I suspect that uh, a younger audience could care less about that. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it just, to your point, which I think is a great one, mm. Macworld has had, has, hopefully still has, that that name recognition, that brand recognition that's been so well established, taking nothing away from Ars Technica, mm. Engadget, any of the others, because there's some great people working mm. at those sites too. But I think Macworld had established itself as an authority, and that was one of the leading places people would go to see reviews. Cool. I sincerely hope it continues. It deserves to, with with Chris at the helm and the people that are working there now, but it's definitely going to make it tougher. Well, one of the things off the record that I've heard, speaking of reviews, is that Macworld is not going to review third-party products nearly as much. A few, maybe, I imagine, like Adobe Photoshop or something like that, the really big one. But basically, the attitude is that we can't afford to spend a lot of time and resources on products that only a small minority of people are ever going to want to use anyway. So the, the next, you know, should you get uh, the, the latest version of Parallels uh, or, or, or not? Uh, um, is that a good update? You know, that, that appeals only to people who are going to install and be interested in running Windows on their Mac, which is a small minority of the Mac users. And so Macro probably isn't going to be talking about Parallels anymore, would be my guess. Uh, and, any, and any other software like that that has a smaller audience gone from Macworld. Uh, so, <clears throat> but Ted, in today's world, what has a large audience? I mean, things well, have become, become so fragmented. And, and in some ways, that's a bad thing. In other ways, it's not because we've we've all gone down different different mm. paths. But I, I guess I'm just I'm really interested in that approach. That uh, what what would qualify if if parallel well, stuff, the stuff from Apple mainly. You know the the iOS uh, updates uh, and the iWork and iLife updates and maybe the major products from Microsoft and Adobe and a few others. Uh, that that would be and, and utilities maybe that become ubiquitous. You know like uh, Text expander might be, you know, qualify there or launch bar if you, you know, through the big utilities that, that have a general appeal. Those are the sort of things that you might still expect to see. A couple of games, maybe. I'm not sure how what the attitude will be towards games. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, and and folks, you know, we should say that we have. Well, Ted has a little bit of knowledge because of being a contributor, but um, you know, we have no idea. And I haven't talked to Chris about it yet. Uh, I, I certainly wish everyone the best, both the, the folks that are left behind manning the, the ship and the ones that have gone on and are, are looking for other opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, you, if you're out there and you're hiring, you could do a lot worse than picking up some of these folks. Hardly, you could hardly do better, I would say. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so. so will you continue to, uh, to be contributing? Well... <sighs> Uh, that's a that's a tougher question for me. I, you know, I, as as I think you know, I have pulled back. Uh, there was a time when I was writing a bugs and fixes column once a week, and, and, and in addition, writing occasional op ed and how to features as well. So I was probably writing maybe five or six articles a month for MacWorld. 
and um, on average. And I've cut that back now to about one or two a month. So cutting it back like to 25% of what I used to be doing. And, and I had been seriously thinking of cutting that further back to zero, essentially, uh, at any given point. Um, right now, I, I'm a little bit on the fence. On the one hand, I'm encouraged to keep going. You know, they, like I said, you, you get this feedback that says we're, you know, we're in a position now where we're going to have to depend on freelance writers more than we did before. And I don't want to abandon them, uh, them who have really been good to me, even though it's not the same people, but it's an institution that's really been good to me, and I don't want to kick them when they're down, so to speak. Um, on the other hand, I don't feel like I'm working for the same bunch of people anymore. You know, so it, it, if everybody that I felt comfortable working with, except for Chris, is gone, uh, I'm less excited about working for them. And, and so that encourages me to think that maybe this is the right time to just exit stage left, as it were. So uh, I, I keep it, it becomes a month to month decision basically. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not willing to forecast that far out in the future. You know, every, every month I, I'll maybe on the first of the month I'll every I'll look at is this the month I'm going to stop writing for MacWorld? And, <laughs> uh, you know, make the decision every month as it goes. So. Yeah, yeah. Tough, uh, tough thing to see happen, especially you know when there's so much excitement around uh, the Apple universe. But I guess everything changes. We've said that how many times too? Yeah, yeah. yeah. To circle back for a second to iOS, uh, because yeah. because there are two things I want to make sure we get in. Um, but what were what were some of the first things you bought for iOS eight and the iPhone six? Uh, in, in the way of applications, did you was there anything you were really waiting for and jumped on? Yes. Um, I wanted to try out the apps that supported the new features. So probably the first thing I looked at was, was apps that had custom keyboards and, and then extensions uh, of various other types. So, yeah, so I looked at Swipe and SwiftKey and Text Expander, the whole custom keyboard thing. That, that, that was probably the first place I went, yes. Being the troubleshooting guy, you, you tend to not just look at the feature sets, but kind of look under the hood. Any thoughts on the the way that the keyboards have been implemented and the fact that we all get that little warning the first time that, uh, or I guess when you install a new one that says, you know, this this app could send your keystrokes somewhere, right? <laughs> and that's directly a little... to, directly to a hacker in in in, uh, in Sweden somewhere. Or yeah. Something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, out of Mongolia. Yeah, yeah. You know that message. I, I had. I felt that that message was sort of like representing a sort of split personality, schizophrenia, whatever, within Apple. Was my attitude because I, I think the wording of that message is determined by Apple. It's not the because there are all the all the apps give you the same message. It's not as if each third party comes up with their message. So I have to assume it comes from Apple, and I think. On the one hand, it's Apple, Apple was sort of saying, well, on the one hand, we're making the system more open because everyone's demanding it and, 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 and we, we feel uh, some desire and, and certainly need to do it. On the other hand, we don't like it very much. <laughs> and so we're going uh, you know, we're gonna, to we're gonna tell you that, you know, yeah, you can do this if you want, but you could be screwed. Don't blame us if, if you wind up regretting it. Not, it'll be your fault. It's not your head. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, I think that's part of what that message is saying. I, I guess it's technically true what they're saying. I haven't really assessed it, but everything that I've read suggests that it isn't really a cause for alarm. You have to say yes, first of all, to use these things. It's not like you have much. Your only choice is to either say yes or give up on the utility altogether, because trying to use the utility with a no answer is not going to get you very far. So you have to essentially decide. Is this something I'm willing to do or, or, or give up on this feature? And I think until I hear otherwise, I'm going to assume that that message is overly alarmist and, and I'm not going to worry too much about it. Oh. If, if I start hear, hearing articles where people say, you know, my, my passwords and credit cards were stolen because of this feature, then I'll start reconsidering. It seems extremely unlikely at the at the at the late hour, but I couldn't help but think about number one, um, the whole nude selfie thing in iCloud, mm -hmm. and the fact that that was not really a hacking situation; it was more of a social engineering situation. Then Tim Cook's statements about you know we need to educate the public better, mm -hmm. uh, you know he didn't he didn't try to 
weasel out of anything, but he just made very clear Apple's going to make these efforts. And I couldn't help but wondering when I first saw it, that after I thought about it a little bit, that is this one of those first efforts that you need to really pay attention to this stuff and figure out? Because, you know, if if there were a nefarious keyboard in there, yeah, it, it's logging everything. It's logging your passwords. It's logging every single thing you do. Mm-hmm. Well, I suppose it, it can't log your password. I shouldn't say can't log your password. It's not likely to log your passwords because the third-party keyboards don't work when you're in, in, those, in password dialogues. So as soon as you're instructed to enter a password, it's only the Apple default keyboard. At least that's what I've heard, and it's been true for me so far. So, um, <clears throat> so Apple made a conscious decision not to allow these third-party keyboards to work um, in passwords. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah, again, I think there's a risk. But you know, people take all sorts of risks. I mean, every time you post anything to Facebook. It's, it's a risk that, the, that whatever you posted, you know, you post a photograph and who the heck knows? So the next day that photograph can be used to determine that, you know, you were at the site of a crime <laughs> and, and you're now a suspect. You know, I mean, who, who knows what, what can happen? When you, it's all the risk these days. Yeah. <clears throat> it just, I guess, I guess because it's Apple, we expect a little bit different standard. And... I mean, I think with Facebook, there's a standard that has been established that you expect, and then unfortunately, it's not a very high one. Um, but with Apple, it, it seems to be higher, especially the way they've been touting security. Mm-hmm. They're touting the fact that they're not sharing your information. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they're touting the fact that now they're trying to encrypt the data so that even they can't get to it if they mm-hmm. want to, um, which is an interesting approach to it. Yeah, well, these keyboards evade that to some extent. That's true. Yeah. And folks, that's not to say that you know, there's a there's a big security concern, as Ted said here. It's just, I, I just I think it was interesting and probably a good thing, especially some of the free ones. You know, I don't know about you, but and and of course we know the folks at Smile, and mm-hmm. so I, I was extremely comfortable installing Text Expander, no problem. Um, some of the others, yeah, not quite as much because I don't know them. They have uh, they haven't been in the Apple uh, space that long this is some of their first foray in a couple cases, mm-hmm. and so you know well, maybe I'll just. Hold off. That's not to say I didn't install some, but there are some others, especially the free ones, that I said no, I don't think so. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Text Expander because uh, you know the article, the most recent article I wrote, which was titled something like uh, "This Is Why iOS 8 Is Such a Big Deal," and it, it gets that I, I feel that iOS 8 is a major shift, turning point, whatever, in Apple's philosophy towards the operating system. And Text Expander is a good example that I've probably written two or three articles over the years in which, among my other complaints, I've cited Text Expander as, as an annoyance on iOS 8. Not that the smile people are, are the problem, but I, I'd want to use Text Expander. Uh, and I discovered that in most of the apps I had, it doesn't work. And the reason it didn't work was because Apple wouldn't let it work. Because Apple had this sandboxing that said basically an app has to be contained within its own sandbox. And Text Expander is, a, is an app whose only reason for being is if it's not in its own <laughs> sandbox. Uh, the only thing it does is allow you to enter shortcuts in apps other than Text Expander. Uh, so if you go to any of the text editing apps and want to use your shortcuts, you couldn't use them. The only way you could use them. Uh, you know, Texas Banner initially found some ways around this, and then Apple closed those loopholes, so they couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and, and then, in the end, the only way Texas Expander could work is if apps were specifically written to support Text Expander. At least that was my understanding. And most apps didn't bother to do this, and so it meant essentially, when you went to iOS 8 devices, as opposed to your Mac, because there's a Text Expander for your Mac too, um, you really didn't have Text Expander. And I would, you know, I'd say, why can't, why can't, well, you know, it's not. Why can't Apple allow it to work a little bit like it works on a Mac? You know, what's the big pro- if it's so terrible? How come it isn't so terrible on a Mac? How come it's perfectly acceptable for Text Expander to do what it's doing on a Mac, but somehow it would be horrendous and, uh, and disastrous if it could do if it did the same thing on iOS devices? I just didn't get it and, and didn't believe it. Well, I, I feel in some sense vindicated because now with this iOS keyboard approach. Uh, uh, the custom keyboard approach, Text Expander, can now work in any app that uses the keyboard. 
which is virtually every app that Texas Expander would want to work in. Uh, and so Apple has conceded, and and now you have the ability to use Text Expander anywhere that you might want to use it. And the, the same thing for One Password, uh, which works in a different sort of way. But I had the same complaint. Uh, you couldn't use One Password in Safari for crying out loud. That's the major place you want to be able to use One Password. That, well, my Mac, that's where I use it 99% of the time. Uh, why can't I use One Password on Safari on my iPhone? Give me a break. Well, Apple heard people like me who complained about that, and now you can. And file sharing uh, is the other big one, with which I've been complaining about for like almost since the iPhone came out. Uh, that that uh, that I couldn't save. Uh, that I had no access to the, to the, the the iOS file system. I couldn't save something to where I wanted. And, and and more more particularly, one app couldn't locate a document created by another app, even if the document was compatible. So. So if you like modified a PDF with one PDF app, and then you wanted for some reason to open it in some other PDF app, you couldn't do it because each PDF app was a separate sandbox, and they could only see the the, the documents that they'd modified. There were some minor ways that you can work around this if you use Dropbox, for instance. Admittedly, I don't want to sound like there was no solution, but they were all these awkward, you know, Jerry rig type solutions. Apple has changed all that with 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 the document picker. Uh, where you can now see iCloud Drive when it's all fully implemented after Yosemite becomes released. Uh, you now can see iCloud Drive. You, 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 know, you get text added on a Mac for the first time. You can save a, doc, a document uh, with text added on a Mac and actually find and open that document uh, uh, on iOS devices, which you couldn't do before. Uh, so it's a whole different attitude. There's still some limitations. It's not clear to me that the iWork documents, for instance, are going to have that ability. Apple, is, Apple may you know, leave it to third-party apps to have this option, and then they're not going to implement it on their own apps for some reason. It's not clear yet. But, uh, but, but at least to a large extent, Apple has done an about-face and really opened up the operating system in a way that they haven't done since the iPhone was first invented. So I think it's really momentous. Do you think we're finally seeing some of Steve Jobs' influence left in the past and, and maybe Tim Cook's and some of the other, Johnny Ive and some of the other movers and shakers at Apple now uh, see things in a little bit different light, uh, specifically opening up some of these things to developers and to us uh, and not maybe having it quite as rigid as it has been in the past? Absolutely, yeah, I do believe that. You know, we remember that when the iPhone first came out, there was no App Store. Steve Jobs said the way third-party developers will add apps to the iPhone is through web apps. And at some point, people, I think Phil Schiller was one of them, uh, um, Scott Forrestal probably, I don't remember all the details, said uh, uh, we should have an App Store where you can have actual third-party apps. And Steve said no. And he, and he took some pretty stiff uh, lobbying to get him to change his mind. Uh, he had, for whatever reason, was very resistant to any sort of opening of the iPhone. Uh, and of course, when the App Store was created, it was very restrictive in terms of what sort of apps could get in, in, in there. And there were a lot of articles about, you know, is, is Apple censoring apps? And is Apple this? And is Apple over, overly restrictive? And uh, the closed App Store versus the open Android. So, and people made arguments, you know, why closed might be better, but and maybe it was in some ways, but still, it was closed, regardless of whether it was better or not. And that was the way Steve wanted it. Uh, and I think there was probably a lot of people in Apple at the time that wanted things more open, but Steve shut them down. And uh, uh, I think uh, with Steve gone, that that, that open contingent is is probably including Tim Cook in that contingent would be my guess or it wouldn't be happening, uh, is, is having more say. Yeah. You know, it's, it, this may sound strange. I'm hoping that it doesn't op too, open up too much because I don't want to see it go to becoming the Android uh, store uh, simply because we've seen virus issues over there. We've seen malware issues over there. I, 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 I understand that there are things that I can't do with my iPhone. Well, now I can do more. But there's still things that I can't do that the Android folks can do. I haven't found a single one yet that is so compelling that 
I've, I want to think about jailbreaking of my phone. In fact, I've never seen one that I wanted to jailbreak my phone, take those chances. So I, I like the fact that Apple is watching, trying to watch out for me. There's some things that are inevitably going to get through, but usually if something even starts to get through and they hear about it, bang, it's, it's, they shut it down quick. Well, first of all, jailbreaking has been dead to me for at least a year. Uh, and I was certainly a, a proponent of jailbreaking. I jailbroke almost every phone I owned up until last year. And somewhere along iOS 7, I just decided it isn't worth it anymore. And it wasn't worth it for two big reasons. One was the iOS had improved to the point that there were less and less things that I needed jailbreaking to do. Because Apple had answered most of the questions uh, and most of the issues I wanted. And with iOS 8, even as we're just discussing, much more so. Uh, and the second is that the jailbreaking had become sufficiently difficult for the jailbreakers to do that it often was six months after the operating system came out before there was a jailbreak for it. And by that time, you were already looking forward to the next version of the operating system. So I didn't want to wait six months. To, you know, I don't want to wait six months to use iOS 8, for instance, because that's how long it might take for a jailbreak version of iOS 8 to come out. So it's not worth it to me. And uh, so I've, I've given up on jailbreak, and, and others have as well. Chris Breen, I think, wrote an article in Macworld about coming to the same conclusion that he's given up on jailbreaking as well for the same sorts of reasons. And uh, so I, I think there will always be a contingent that jailbreaks, but I, I don't think it, it's really a significant factor on the iPhone anymore. I also don't think you're going to have to worry about Apple devices becoming like Android devices. <laughs> There's still a lot of sandboxing there. There's still a lot of restrictions. Apple still has a lot of control over how things work. It's not It's not at all an open system. And uh, I think Apple intends it to keep, keep it uh, fairly restricted and probably in many cases for good reasons, as you're pointing out. Yeah. I know I'm, I'm a lot more comfortable. In fact, a friend called me last night and said, I'm out, I'm out of contract. What phone should I get? Mm -hmm. And he was not uh, an iPhone user, and it's like, well, why would you go with an Android? Mm -hmm. Especially now. Now, if you want a big phone, you can have a big phone. Mm -hmm. You want not so big a phone, you can have not so big a phone. You want a smaller phone, you can go mm -hmm. with the 5S or even down to the 5C. So what what is there that's compelling over on that side when there are clear benefits to the, the Apple ecosystem? Mm -hmm. And I think his only answer was, you know, potentially the price. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, if, if that's what's in your way, spend the money. Spend mm -hmm. the money and, and be safe. You know, you, you buy insurance on in your house and your car. Why wouldn't you pay, mm -hmm. you know, that extra mm -hmm. price as insurance for being secure? Well, I, yes. And I think getting back to one of your original questions at the start of this whole talk that we've had, You've answered it again in, in a way, and that is uh, what's special about the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus, uh, and, and that is the sizes really make a big difference, that, that when someone's in the market for a phone and they say, I want a 5-inch phone or whatever, 5-inch or greater display, and you say, well, the biggest Apple has is the 4-inch 5S. Well, screw that. <laughs> I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get an Apple. There's no way I want to get a four inch display. Apple was losing out to an entire segment of the market on that alone. And with the 4.7 to 5.5 inch iPhone 6s, that's not true anymore. Uh, there might be a few features still that I could think of that, that's, uh, that are Android only that some people would want that would force them to lean towards getting Androids, but they're very few. Uh, and I think for the majority of users, there is no reason to say, this is why I have to get an Android phone because an iPhone won't do. Now, now it's much more a question of which one would I rather have. Exactly. Ted, we've got so much more to cover, we, to catch up. And of course, I think it's fair to say that there'll be one or two other things happening as we go forward. So. Just a few. Well, next month, of course, there, there's every reason to believe that there's going to be an October uh, Apple Media event where new iPads are announced, uh, where Yosemite's release date is going to be announced. And I would like to think, because Yosemite's release date is going to be announced, that they may release some new products that run Yosemite. I, I would like to see um, new iMacs, for instance, which has been a long time, and may, maybe a new Mac Mini. It would be great if those were announced uh, at, at that time. And also, um, well, while you're getting me talking on this, sorry to... <laughs> I, I, I think it's time for a new Apple TV, a new fourth-generation Apple TV to come around. Uh, 
that uh, I was just talking about this on Twitter today, the new peer-to-peer -peer AirPlay feature that's in iOS 8, as it turned out, much to my surprise, not only works only on the third generation Apple TV, but it only works on a second revision to the original Apple TV that came out, I think, about a year after the first third generation came out. So if you want to use this new feature you, you, uh, with your Apple TV, it has to, it's only on the very, very latest. Even, even if you have a third generation Apple TV, it's not guaranteed it will work. You have to have the later revision to it, and I don't. Uh, and so I currently don't know. I, I own two Apple TVs. One's a second generation and one's an early third generation. And neither one of them work with this feature. So if I want to test out this feature, I have to get a new Apple TV. But I'm not going to get a new Apple TV because the last you know major revision, the third generation model, was like over two years ago or something like that. And I have to think that you know Apple is ready in a new version, and I'll wait for the fourth generation to come out, and then I'll pounce. So I have this money in my hand saying, here, Apple, I'm, I'm ready to give it to you. As soon as it's, it's, I'm handing it over as soon as you announce the product and just announce it already. So um, I'm hopeful that that might happen, too. It does seem kind of unbelievable that we've seen the end of the the updates to the product line heading into the holiday season. Mm -hmm. So I'm with you. I don't I don't know which ones. And, of course, the one thing you didn't mention is a Retina MacBook Air. Yeah, I have a feeling we're not going to see that. But uh, I, they, they did a speed bump a few months ago, and I think the product cycle is such that those updates come in the first half of the year, uh, when not the second half is for these sort of products. And, of course, we haven't at all talked, so I'm speaking of what's coming down the road, we haven't at all talked today about the Apple Watch. Maybe we could save that for another day. Yeah, I, I think we'll be talking a lot about that. There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot to be analyzed and said, and, and hopefully as we get more information, things will become a little clearer. So, mm -hmm. Well, we will be hopefully back on a regular schedule. I think both of us now have stabilized things a little bit. So uh, see you back here in a little while to keep on going. All right. Sounds right. good. I look Perfect. forward to it. Great to see you. Yeah, you too. Folks, Mac Notables on Mac Voices, the talk of the Mac community, that's us. We want you to be here every time we're here. So check out macvoices.com. Even when we're not here. Even when we're not here, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Still check out MattVoices.com. Right. Until the next time, I'm Chuck Joyner. Thanks for watching. <laughs>